All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to day two of the Ancestral Health Symposium. My name is Ben Greenfield, and I've been tasked with the job of tormenting the presenters uh, for the first half of the day today. So I'll be introducing uh, James Steele, our first presenter. Uh, James is, as you will find out very soon, a foreigner. Uh, he studies uh, at Southampton University. He's a PhD candidate there. Uh, with a particular focus in the realm of resistance training. And among other things, uh, James actually has, as I learned at last night's dinner, a very asymmetrical and dysfunctional pelvis from falling over on his bicycle at a stoplight. So you can try to get that visual out of your head while he's presenting today. It's also James's birthday, which I also just found out. So. We'll refrain from singing you happy birthday, James, but we'll at least say it. So on three, one, two, three, happy birthday, James. All right, take it away, man. Okay, right. Um, Okay, so just to give you a kind of uh, overview of what I'm going to be covering in this talk. Um, when I first started putting it together, I kind of had this idea that I knew what I wanted to say. Um, I was familiar with some of the literature around the area by like guys like Lauren Cordain, James O'Keefe, and uh, Boyd Eaton, some of the earlier review papers where they had kind of proposed these ideas of you know, hunter-gatherer type fitness, evolutionary fitness, paleo fitness, whatever you want to call it. Um, but when I started really getting stuck into the literature, I started to see that it, things weren't necessarily as rosy or romantic as uh, these authors have kind of uh, portrayed them. So what, what I'm going to hopefully do is give a bit more of a kind of sober view of uh, this uh, notion of uh, evolutionary fitness and, and whether or not some of the ideas we have about hunter-gatherer physical activity patterns actually tie up with recommendations from modern exercise physiology in terms of best ways to kind of optimize our physical fitness. So... In terms of background, we've got a lot of, uh, you know, a string of recent uh, academic papers which have kind of discussed these topics, as I said, said some of the more recent ones by, like, James O'Keefe and, uh, and his colleagues. Um, we've also had some recent papers in uh, sports medicine looking at uh, applying these kind of ideas to training athletes. Um, and within the lay press as well, we've got, you know, a number of kind of more popular uh, manifestations of these things. We've got like Daryl Edwards with his paleo fitness. Um, we've got you know, various uh, other things. This, I found this book, uh, it's quite old, Instinctive Fitness. We've got MoveNat um, and CrossFit as well, various things which kind of use this kind of uh, evolutionary justification in some way for what they're doing. Although I've recently learned that CrossFit are actually suing the National Strength and Conditioning Association. So we'll pretend I didn't actually talk about CrossFit, <laughs> just in case this gets out to Greg Glassman and, you know, I get, I get a lawsuit on me. So um, uh, they, we've often got this notion that kind of hunter-gatherers were fit, they were strong, they were healthy, they were robust. You know, we've got all this, these uh, studies which are rolled out time and time again to indicate that they were, you know, they were fast. We've got uh, um, analysis of the footprints uh, uh, later early from T8 suggesting that he was as fast, maybe if not faster than like Usain Bolt. Um, modern hunter-gatherers tend to have higher VO2 maxes than uh, the average population. Um, studies by uh, like uh, Sean Stock at uh, Cambridge and uh, earlier stuff by Ruff suggest that hunter-gatherers were strong and robust based on their skeletal remains. Um, and obviously, you know, they've got lower body fat percentages and generally better body composition than us. And these are the studies that are kind of continuously rolled out to kind of justify these, these kind of romantic pictures. But I wonder whether or not that is kind of a bit of a romanticized, you know, a, rom a romantication of it, and uh, whether or not the majority of the literature actually kind of supports that idea. So in terms of uh, what kind of, you know, uh, we're seeing uh, in terms of the importance of physical activity in everyday life nowadays is that we, we all know that being physically active is important. And uh, being physically active reduces uh, all-cause mortality um, in a kind of dose-response manner. So the more we're physically active, the more we get an effect from it. But recent research is starting to question this idea that the amount of physical activity is the most important factor. And actually, 
the intensity of, or you know, I'm, I'll, I'll touch on uh, what I mean by intensity because it's a, it's a kind of touchy topic uh, nowadays in exercise, uh, exercise science. But certainly the physical fitness that people have, um, which seems to be related to the intensity of the activity that they actually engage in, seems to be the more important factor. So for exa example, people who have higher fit, uh, physical fitness measures such as VO2 max, or uh, strength, muscle mass, they tend to be more strongly predictors of uh, all-cause mortality. Um, and as an example as well, I actually added this study in a couple of days ago, which I came across. Um, it was a study in, uh, in Finnish men that looked at the intensity of the activities that they were engaging in uh, and found that the more intense their leisure time physical activity was, the more their all-cause, oh, sorry, their cancer uh, risk was reduced. Um, but interestingly, the lower intensity activities, which didn't provide much of a protective effect, would be considered to be typical kind of foraging, like hunter-gatherer type activity. So there was a lot of berry picking, there was a lot of uh, foraging, fishing, hunting, and all these sorts of things, which we think, oh, you know, that's what hunter-gatherers did, and that's what made them fit and healthy and robust and you know, free of diseases. But this recent study suggests that actually they don't provide as strong a protective effect as we potentially think they might do. So in terms of evolutionary fitness re recommendations, that's kind of asking the question of you know, what should we do? And Looking back at the literature, they seem to have focused on uh, the following questions in determining what those recommendations are. So looking at what evolved traits we have that determine our physical activity uh, capacity and limitations, so asking as homo sapiens, what can we do? Uh, and looking at either extinct or extent hunter-gatherers' physical activity patterns and asking the question of what did we do? And kind of trying to draw recommendations from them. But what I think is a more appropriate way of doing it is to kind of synthesize that with what modern exercise physiology research suggests. And now I'm going to kind of limit the talk by saying, saying the premise of this talk is that I'm going to focus on uh, what effect these physical activity patterns have on physical fitness measures, because as I've just noted, they have quite a strong uh, uh, association with all-cause mortality. Um, and I'm going to be looking at kind of synthesizing some of the observations we have about these hunter-gatherer physical activity patterns with what modern exercise physiology says. I also want to kind of make a note uh, beforehand to say that although in the past our physical activity was directed predominantly towards survival, in modern society, physical activity is kind of differentiated, certainly from exercise. So exercise is what I'm going to be focusing on, what exercise recommendations we can draw from the literature in terms of physical activity patterns of hunter-gatherers. So what recommendations can we make for directed physical activity, exercise in essence, for improving physical fitness factors? So the question is, what exercise should we be doing? So as an outline, I'm going to try and answer these three quest questions. What can we do? What did we do? What should we do? And then provide some conclusions and potentially some recommendations. So in terms of answering those questions of what can we do, I'm going to look at what sort of activity repertoire we seem to be evolved for, what, what capacity do we have. In terms of what did we do, I want to look back at uh, some of the uh, physical activity patterns in our evolutionary past. So we'll look at some of the physical activity patterns of other primate species, and what the uh, literature suggests in terms of extinct human populations, and what it suggests in terms of extant uh, hunter-gatherer populations as well. And then try to tie that up with what recent evidence suggests uh, in terms of whether we should or should not emulate these patterns, if we can actually determine what they are. Okay, so I, I'm going to steal some concepts from uh, Dan Liebman's talk at Harvard a few years ago, ago, just to keep in mind when we're talking about what activity repertoire we're kind of adapted for, what physical capacity we have. So obviously what we're looking at is, uh, is what adaptations do we have, what useful features do we have that have uh, improved our evolutionary fitness, our reproductive fitness. Because it's important to remember that although we may have adaptations that promote reproductive fitness, they don't necessarily promote health and they don't necessarily promote what we would typically consider in modern exercise physiology as being physical fitness. So there's a differentiation to make between reproductive success uh, in terms of evolutionary fitness and physical fitness. It's also important to remember that just because we can do it doesn't necessarily mean we should do it, and that's where the tie-up with uh, modern exercise physiology is going to come around. Um, okay, so 
One of the key things, and it's obvious to everyone, we don't even really need to go into the literature in depth with it, but we're obviously bipedal. We're adapted to bipedal locomotion. And I talked about this last year in my uh, talk in Atlanta, where I covered some of the, uh, uh, the literature revolving around the emergence of different uh, uh, locomotion patterns and how we've kind of transitioned from a uh, predominantly quadrupedal arboreal uh, locomotion pattern through semi-terrestrial quadrupedalism into more habitual bipedalism. And uh, with last year's talk, I was focusing on some of the, uh, the changes within the, uh, within the uh, lumbar spine and the pelvis and how that might impact on lower back pain. So there are a number of different adaptations, though, obviously, which promote uh, our, uh, our ability to uh, walk by move bipedally. Um, and we obviously have adaptations, and some of you will probably have seen this in uh, Dan Lieberman's paper, uh, uh, Bramble and Lieberman's paper in Nature. There's a whole list of different adaptations which promote both uh, efficacy in terms of walking bipedally, but also running as well. So we can walk and we can run, and there were reasons for why you know, we may have adapted those physical tra traits in terms of environment, uh, increasing food availability, increasing range, um, reducing cost of transport, certainly for walking, although not so much for running. Our cost of transport for running tends to be on average higher than most other species, although we tend to have a flatter curve that, uh, when we increase the uh, velocity of transport. Uh, and there are a number of adaptive advantages to that as well. So obviously being bipedal, increased visual field as we were moving into a new environment. As I said, there was a reduced cost of transport for walking. So our daily range could have expanded considerably as well. Obviously, we're all aware, where hopefully if we're familiar with like Dan Lieberman's stuff, that you know, being bipedal confers a significant firmer regulation advantage as well. And also having the hands free means that we can start to carry more objects. Uh, we evolved tool use. It increased uh, our ability for food acquisition in terms of you know, um, movement and uh, berry picking and foraging and that sort of thing as well. We've also obviously had uh, adaptations in terms of our upper body physical capacity as well. And uh, we've lost potentially a lot of our specializations for our boreal quadrupedalism. So our, our, upper, our upper bodies aren't necessarily the same as some of our earlier ancestors. We've lost that uh, specialization for our boreal uh, locomotion. But, and again, this is going back to some of the studies from uh, Ruff, uh, uh, suggest that Neanderthals, uh, early Homo, they looked as though they potentially were quite heavily muscled looking at their skeletal uh, robusticity. Um, but we've got, there's quite a lot of differences I'll go into uh, shortly in terms of what the results uh, of other studies actually suggest. There's quite a lot of uh, variation in samples which might be related to uh, climate and environmental differences. Um, but it's reasonable to say as well, as Cordain and colleagues uh, uh, speculated in one of their earlier papers, that because of the lack of hafted uh, tools, compound levers, we probably had quite, uh, quite a lot of our body physical capacity in terms of uh, strength and endurance for the tool use as that adapted. But over the years, we've also seen a, a reduction in that musculature. If we look at some of the stuff from uh, Shaw and Stock, which seems to be coincident with uh, more advanced tool specialization. So as hafted tools were created, needs uh, requires less in terms of our body physical capacity to use them. So we see a kind of trend towards a reduction, a potential reduction in the musculature based on the uh, robusticity remains. Um, it, but, and again, it's difficult when we look at these types of data, when we're looking at uh, um, skeletal remains in terms of trying to determine what muscular capacity looked like. Um, because they can be a reflection of physical activity patterns themselves and not necessarily an, adapt, uh, an, adapt, an adaptation in terms of an evolutionary adaptation to those physical activity patterns. So it's, it's kind of difficult to kind of draw, you know, chicken and egg scenario there, which one uh, came first. Um, it's obviously also important to remember as well that we have adapted as an adaptive system. So our bodies do respond to the demands we placed on them. And uh, you know, our capacity broadly matches the demands we place on it in everyday day life. The body doesn't want to waste energy. Excess capacity is costly. So it's an evolutionary advantage to have an adaptive system that responds to the demands that we place on it. OK. so. We'll move on then to what some of the physical activity patterns in our evolutionary past were. Now, a lot of the earlier papers have focused on energy expenditure, trying to determine what our physical activity levels were as such. So if you look at some of the earlier papers, you'll see tables like this, where they look at what the uh, total energy expenditure was, what uh, activity energy expenditure may have been, work out physical activity levels based on the ratio of uh, uh, resting metabolic rate and uh, total energy expenditure. Um, or you see 
tables like this, which uh, make suggestions as to what kind of modern activities result in the same sort of energy expenditure. Um, but you know, as we're kind of aware as well, energy expenditure isn't necessarily that important when it comes to exercise. Exercise isn't great in terms of the energy expenditure it provides. And I think it's more interesting to focus on what exercise variables and what manipulation of those variables actually promotes adaptations or, or uh, changes in physical fitness that promote longevity, health, reduce all-cause mortality, and so on and so forth. So this synthesis is going to kind of consider what, uh, what we can draw in terms of uh, how frequently active were hunter-gatherer populations, uh, what sort of volume of activity did they engage in, um, what intensity of activity they engaged in. And uh, I've discussed this recently in a paper where in this talk I'm going to be referring to intensity as the effort, uh, how hard the actual work was, not necessarily the typical uh, definition of intensity that you see in like resistance training literature, which often refers to the loading. And it's difficult sometimes when we're looking at physical activity patterns to determine what the actual loading was. So in this I'm going to focus more on what sort of types of activities and what sort of modes of activities were actually engaged in. And then obviously the important thing is, what can we draw from the data when we look at it in terms of providing some sort of overall picture of how frequently, uh, how uh, much, uh, how hard, and uh, what types of activities uh, hunter-gatherers were engaging in, and how we can use that to potentially provide some recommendations for promoting fitness. So we're going to start off looking at other primates. And the data is a bit uh, sporadic on this. So there are some studies where it's difficult to determine some of those variables I was just talking about. But in general, when we look at it, it, the frequency of activity is very, very seasonal in other primates, although the types and kind of modes of activities that they engage in tend to be relatively consistent. So you see a lot of activities which you'll see in kind of, uh, you know, some of the more kind of primal play type sessions that Daryl was, uh, was uh, doing this morning and uh, yesterday. Um, you know, a, a lot of uh, kind of clambering, climbing, sitting, walking, running, bounding, brachiation, which is kind of swinging from the, uh, from the arms, although we've lost that kind of specialization to be as good at that. In terms of volume of activity, though, they tend to not be anywhere near as active as this kind of romantic picture of, uh, of primates kind of uh, tends to be portrayed. So uh, their, their range around their uh, daily range tends to be very, very low. They tend to, you know, on average move around about half to one and a half kilometers uh, a day. Um, and when you look at some of the data on how much time they actually spend resting or what we would probably consider to be in sedentary, uh, act, uh, uh, sedentary uh, activity, it's actually very, very high. So they spend a lot of time lounging around, resting, sitting, standing. They sit a lot, which is uh, surprising because sitting kills you, apparently. Um, and they spend very little time actually moving around. But yet they tend to be fit, strong, healthy, low body compositions, and so on and so forth. So again, is the volume of activity, the frequency of activity necessarily important? These are other primates, though, so it's difficult to say. So that was looking at kind of arboreal quadrupeds. If we look at, uh, obviously, that, that varies by species as well. So you do have some species which spend a lot of time lounging around, and other species which don't spend anywhere near as much time. But on average, they do tend to spend a fair amount of time just chilling out. If we look at uh, semi-terrestrial quadrupeds, so like the greater apes, uh, uh, chimpanzees, bonobos, uh, gorillas, again, we see as body size increases, there's a... There's a an increase in range, but again, they do tend to spend a lot of their time kind of chilling out, you know, sitting, eating, although, as we know, with some of the great rapes, that might be related to, you know, their gut physiology, and they need to actually perform that type of activity regularly. Um, but again, the types of, and uh, modes of exercise are what we would typically expect to see in this type of uh, species. Um, and again, if we look at, for example, changes in our uh, ability to perform certain activities, as I said, we've lost that kind of upper body specialization to engage in um, specialized arboreal locomotion, such as brachiation. And we tend to see there's kind of a gradient in terms of our ability and, our frequent, and the frequency of uh, brachiation that you see in the great ape species as you move closer and closer to, um, to humans. So, primates spend a lot of time sitting around, not doing a lot. Interestingly as well, they actually spend what I thought was less time than I would have expected to see socializing and playing. They just kind of chill out a lot and then occasionally they'll play a little bit and you know, then they might move a little bit and then they might eat and then they'll just go for a nap again. So they spend a lot of time being sedentary. Okay, so let's move on to what uh, physical activity patterns we can try to draw from 
extinct hunter-gatherer populations, what the, uh, the skeletal remains kind of suggest to us. Now, the idea of reconstructing physical activity patterns of extinct hunter-gatherers has been uh, termed by Germain and colleagues as the bioarchaeology holy grail. It's, a, it's this mythical thing that's really hard to determine. But people try and attempt it by looking at skeletal remains, looking at changes in articular modification, musculoskeletal stress markers, which indicate potentially the types of forces and, uh, that are being placed on the musculature, skeletal robusticity and changes in the geometry of certain uh, bones that might reflect engagement in certain types of loading or activities. So I thought to myself, great, right, I'm going to look at the literature and I'm going to try and draw out these variables again, see what we can get, you know, because I had this image in my head that hunting gatherers were going to be you know, really active, really fit, and you know, we were going to be able to draw out these amazing recommendations. But when I sat and tried to look through the literature, I felt a little bit like it was doing this at me. <laughs> it was fatting in my general direction. So it, it, was, it was almost impossible to try and draw out a physical activity level or pattern specifically. And, and even two decades ago, it, authors in the paleoanthropological literature were kind of saying there is clearly no particular physical activity pattern that uh, categorizes hunter-gatherer populations. It varies massively by geography, their culture, their technological advancements. For example, after the last glacial maximum, as environment changed considerably, there was a decline in physical activity. Although the actual populations haven't necessarily changed, they just got more sedentary. Um, in some studies, you see that there's a sexual division of labor, so men and women tend to uh, perform different activities, although their physical activity levels remain relatively similar. But in some populations, you don't even see that sexual dimorphism. You don't see differences in males and females. So again, it makes it difficult to determine what kinds of activities you know, they, were, they were doing. Also, and even more interestingly, when you look at studies of skeletal robusticity and other uh, uh, um, skeletal stress markers, there are some studies that suggest that hunter-gatherers are no different than agricultural populations, some studies where they clearly are greater, and some studies where they're actually worse than agricultural populations. So again, it's really difficult to try and determine whether or not they were more or less the same active, and it starts to question whether or not there are really differences between us and modern populations as well, because some studies actually so show similar um, skeletal robusticities when you bring the whole body of literature into, into, into account. Also, the... Uh, idea that we can infer that they engaged in specific types and modalities and then try and draw recommendations for engaging in certain activities is a bit folly as well, because cultural materials don't always correlate with the musculoskeletal stress markers that we see. So the stress markers that you expect to see from engaging in certain activities doesn't necessarily tie up with the cultural remains, that the archaeological kind of evidence that you find with those populations. Um, and even though we have kind of recorded, uh, ethnographically recorded divergent physical activity patterns between different populations of hunter-gatherers, you don't always see differences in, uh, in the uh, skeletal morphology. Also, some of the recent research from uh, sports medicine as well has started to suggest that actually maybe we can kind of determine whether they were engaging in uh, linear running or more intermittent kind of sprinting, whether they were endurance running or, or spending more time kind of uh, intermittently sprinting, or whether they were doing a lot of running that involved changes in direction, because some studies have suggested that uh, uh, tibial and fibular morphology differs between those different types of activities when you compare different times of sports. But then again, other studies don't show that difference, and it makes it very difficult to determine what kinds of movement patterns we were actually engaging in. So, were we engaging in these types of activities? Should we still be engaging in them? I don't know. Being a bit facetious, maybe we should be engaging in this kind of activity because some of the evidence suggests that we clearly spent a lot of time around large ungulates, and I just love this because I wanted to put it in, unkindly disposed to the humans involved. So perhaps we should be spending more time rodeo riding because clearly uh, that's the type of activities that uh, early humans engaged in. Maybe not. So I just wanted to read out this example to kind of highlight the, or this quote to highlight the folly of kind of trying to draw recommendations or, or even draw any conclusions of what those physical activity patterns were. So uh, Mayer and colleagues kind of highlighted that inadequate sample size, too far-reaching conclusions, and neglect of other possible explanations are among the problems easily recognized in the literature. Many assumptions are lacking a sound experimental basis, and it becomes increasingly evident that there are many more problems and limits of interpretation than have been usually acknowledged in the recent past. It also appears that many results which have been interpreted in terms of sexual division of labor may in fact be expressions of the intrinsic sexual dimorphisms of homo, homo sapiens, and not culture or population specific peculiarities. 
Also acknowledging the results of many studies from the field of sports medicine, it appears doubtful that ad adult activity pattern, patterns of activity can truly be isolated from those which stem from the formative years of human skeleton during the sub-adult growth period. And that's an important point as well, because sometimes when we look at skeletal remains, they don't necessarily reflect adult physical activity patterns. They reflect what the uh, sample was doing during their formative period, because that's when there's the most bone adaptation in response to physical activity patterns. Okay, so moving on to extant hunter-gatherers then. And we have a lot more data for this, really. So what I wanted, again, was to figure out what manipulation of these variables produces this. So, in terms of frequency, see, most hunter-gatherers tend to spend a lot of time physically active, but not necessarily doing things that we would consider to be exercise, probably more like chores, a bit of housework here, a bit of foraging here, very low-intensity stuff. You know, they were normally active, but not active in the way that we would consider to be active during directed exercise. Uh, also, if we try, you know, if you buy into the idea that we were, we've evolved to perform endurance running, the frequency of that is hard to determine as well in some cases, because if you look at some of the data that is available on it, they would probably maybe do an endurance run every three to five days when they were successful. It's a bit, a little bit more difficult to determine how frequently they did it when the hunts were unsuccessful. But, you know, there was a very low frequency in terms of uh, engaging in that more intense type activity. In terms of the volume of activity, as I've said, you know, there was a lot of daily activity. And the fact that we engage in kind of random type walk, uh, power law distribution uh, walk patterns does indicate that we probably evolve, uh, you know, uh, hunter-gatherers use a large, uh, have a large daily range. So they do spend a lot of time moving around, just not necessarily moving around at high intensity. Um, for example, hunter-gatherers do tend to kind of have regular movements at their camps and stuff as well throughout the year. So they, on average, move every, few, every couple of weeks or so. And they might move, you know, an average of kind of 10 miles or so, so in terms of moving their properties. But then some populations around their campsites and their base, current bases they uh, tend to have, again, quite a small range. So uh, if you look at some of the recommendations from Cordain and O'Keefe, they kind of recommend a range of 6 to uh, 16 kilometers uh, uh, of daily move movement in terms of locomotion. But it's difficult to determine whether or not that's really the types of, you know, the range of uh, locomotion that we should be engaging in. Again, though, and this harkens back to the other primate species, when you observe hunter-gatherer populations and foraging populations, they spend a hell of a lot of time resting. They spend a lot of time sedentary. They spend a lot of time lying around, sitting down, just chatting with each other, you know, laughing. Um, children tend to spend, spend a bit more time being active. And when children are involved in kind of foraging activities, they do tend to go on quite long walks uh, and spend a lot of time foraging, picking berries and that sort of thing. But again, as we said, that's not necessarily associated with uh, improvements in, uh, in um, health outcomes and fitness outcomes. Now, um, all of the presenters uh, have been invited to provide a, uh, an accompanying paper to the Journal of Evolution and Health for these uh, presentations. So one of the things I've done for the uh, paper, so you'll be able to see the uh, raw data in there, is I tried to pull together all of the studies I could find that actually report a physical activity le level, uh, so ratio of uh, uh, total energy expenditure to uh, resting metabolic rate, for different hunter-gatherer populations, both male and female, agricultural populations, and modern populations as well. And then to compare that to what Eaton and Eaton, and Eaton suggested was the Paleolithic standard for the uh, physical activity levels. And when I plugged that into uh, SPSS and actually ran some stats on it, there was no significant difference between the two. I mean, if you look at the hunter-gatherer and agricultural populations, it does seem to be slightly higher but in terms of whether or not those differences, and certainly compared to the Paleolithic standard, as uh, Eden and Eaton kind of uh, suggested, there's not as much difference as we would expect. So hunter-gatherers are probably a little bit more active than we are, but mm, how much more? You know, are we romanticizing how active they actually are? I think potentially we are. Now, the intensity of the activities or the, the, the uh, vigorousness of the activities that they're engaging in, I think, is the more interesting thing to look at. So again, as we said, said these are studies looking at the Bolivian Amerindians, um, which suggests that they spend the majority of their time engaging in what were considered to be kind of lifestyle activities. So housework, you know, or, you know camp work, more likely, uh, you know, a little bit of foraging here and there, all very, very low intensity, kind of what Mark Sisson suggests, you know, move a lot at a very low intensity. Um, but they do also spend a little bit of time engaged in very, very vigorous activity. In fact, you probably can't see it on this, but I thought it was quite amusing that when you differentiate between day and night and look at the male populations, 
There's a couple of minutes each night that the males are engaged in very vigorous activity. <laughs> the women aren't, so it doesn't lead me to question what the males might be doing at that time of night. So, but anyway, the point is that uh, the hunter-gatherer hunter populations do spend, you know, probably a little bit more more time on activity than we do. They're probably a bit more active. But more importantly, I think, is that they do spend time engaged in very vigorous intensity activity. So, for example, example even Dr. Kim Hill's kind of observations suggested that you know, the average speed that uh, hunter-gatherer populations tend to move around is, is of, you know, 1.5 to 3 kilometers per hour is a really slow stroll. It's just moseying around. But then every now and then they would engage in sprint type activities, very high intensity type stuff. Again, if you look at persistence hunting average speed, 6.1 kilometers per hour is actually, you know, just a bit of a route march. It's still walking. It doesn't indicate that we should necessarily be engaging in kind of endurance running or that type of activity. I'm sorry, no, there was another uh, one here. So this is a uh, study that's looked at physical activity uh, levels within children popula uh, child populations in uh, I can't remember what uh, group these were now. But anyway, again, it highlights the point that although there's differences between sort of different uh, hunter-gatherer groups, they spend some portion of their time engaged in very, very high-intensity activity, which I think is the point that we've kind of been missing a lot in terms of uh, activity recommendations. So what kind of types of activities are hunter-gatherer, excellent hunter-gatherers uh, engaging in. So, and hopefully you're all kind of familiar with uh, Peter Gray's stuff. He suggests that, you know, they spend a lot of time playing, but that the play that they engage in is more kind of in spirit than what we would consider to be physical activity type play. So there's a lot of humor, there's a lot of laughing, joking, that kind of thing. There's a lot of kind of creative activity, but not necessarily play as in what we see kids doing in the playground, running around, doing that sort of stuff. Um, so apart from the children, the adults do play, but it's more kind of you know, what we would expect to be doing, doing as adults rather than what we would expect to be doing as children. Um, you know, they spend a lot of time, time walking, as we said. They do walk around, around a lot. They spend a lot of time randomly walking in various directions when they're foraging, looking for different things, trying to expand their range, expand the amount of, uh, of uh, return they can get on their actual uh, foraging expeditions. Um, and a lot of time walking around their camps, huts, and that sort of thing as well. But again, as we said, the range is not necessarily as large as we expect it would normally be. Running, though, is a bit more difficult to, uh, to kind of decide whether they did run. We can run, as we said, we're adapted to run, but do we actually run? Mm, don't know. Certainly when some populations have been looked at, at they've, none of the uh, uh, tribe were observed running at any time. They spend a lot of time walking, but they were never seen running. So whether or not we can recommend that is, a, you know, is it necessary for us to run? Maybe, maybe not. And obviously, we've got the normal kinds of uh, activities which we expect to see in hunter-gatherer populations, which are necessary for the types of lifestyles they lead, lead, which differ between men and women. So hunting, trapping, women are spending more time gathering, food preparation, and that sort of thing. Um, but interestingly, in a recent st study, it showed that some hunter-gatherer populations do spend quite a lot of time engaged in arboreal locomotion, despite the fact that we're not that specialized for it anymore. So that's an interesting point to look at as well. Okay, so obviously all of these kind of things that we see in uh, extant hunter-gatherer populations are going to be affected uh, potentially by uh, you know, their environment, habitat quality, hunting, logistical mobility, that sorts of things. So if they're in a rich environment, they tend to be more sedentary because they don't need to engage as much physical activity in uh, procuring uh, energy. Whereas uh, if they're in a, in a poor habitat location, they'll either spend time moving and relocating or they'll spend more time kind of foraging and engaging in physical activity for those reasons. Interestingly, though, though modernization doesn't seem to have affected their physical activity levels as much as we expect it to. And that might be because actually their physical activity levels don't differ as much from ours as we generally think they do. Okay, so what sort of things can we can conclude, conclude from this, and then how do we tie it up with modern exercise physiology? So looking at it, there seems to be no one physical activity pattern that's typically ancestral. It's really difficult also to determine whether or not something is an adaptation and thus has resulted in us engaging in those physical activities, or whether or not we engaging in those physical activities has produced an adaptation which we see at sea. So uh, we seem, tend to see as well, there's very low to moderate uh, and inconsistent relationships between physical uh, fitness and actual physical activity levels, so the amount of physical activity they do. Um, also, it's difficult to determine whether or not 
for example, changes in uh, brain size actually facilitated increases in physical activity or whether it's the other way around. And I'm going to suggest that you all hang around for Skylar's talk as well because he's going to talk a bit about how uh, resistance training can enhance uh, cognitive capacity and uh, change our brains as well. So again, it's a chicken and egg kind of scenario. Which direction does it go? Is it bi-directional? Who knows? And can we draw any conclusions from that in terms of exercise recommendations? Um, I'm going to have to go pretty quick because I just realized I'm running out of time. So. Let's move on very quickly there then. So the current evolutionary fitness recommendations, uh, uh, most up-to-date ones from O'Keefe and colleagues in their recent pa papers, are along these lines. And I'm going to focus obviously on, on which ones are deter uh, determined physical, activity, uh, sorry, physical fitness adaptations. So how do we corroborate these with uh, modern exercise physiology? So do the recommendations that are currently being made agree with evidence regarding manipulation of those training variables for improving health, of, uh, sorry, fitness outcomes like cardiovascular fitness, strength, hypertrophy, so on and so forth? So the current public health guidelines have been questioned a lot recently because they focus more on the volume of activity, but yet they don't seem to provide the benefits that we would expect them to. And what we're starting to see is actually that physical fitness measures seem to be more closely associated with reduction in all-cause mortality, and that higher intensity activity seems to have a, a closer impact on this as well. So maybe what we've been focusing on in terms of the high volume of low intensity activity that hunter-gatherers engage in, what we should be focusing on is the more intense stuff. We should be focusing on the fact that they engage in these activities, whereas we tend to not engage in those activities, certainly in the general population. So there's growing evidence that higher intensity uh, exercise uh, significantly improves cardiovascular fitness. We may not even need to re uh, engage in interval type training. Just single bursts of high intense activity seems to be uh, important for that. In terms of uh, strength and hypertrophy as well, you can bin all the other variables. They're important, kind of, but the most important factor in terms of determining strength and hypertrophy outcomes from strength tra training is the intensity of effort put forth. Obviously, in terms of frequency, we know that uh, varying that based on uh, physical preparedness of the individual is important. So autoregulation is one of the only kind of uh, periodization programs that seems to be consistently supported. And, shock horror, the mode of exercise doesn't even seem to be as important as we think it is for producing improvements in physiological fitness uh, measures. So on that topic of modalities, and very, very quick, quickly, um, even in the kind of skills and activities that uh, modes of exercise that hunter-gatherers engage in, we tend to see that physical fitness tends to uh, impact them quite considerably, but actually it's more about practice makes perfect. And in today's society, do we really need to spend time practicing how to perform certain activities that hunter-gatherers perform when we don't need to perform those skills in today's life, when perhaps we should instead just be focusing on improving physical fitness outcomes? So, and again, just very quick, quickly, recent work from myself and other, uh, other areas are starting to question this idea of a mode-type uh, dichotomy between resistance-type exercise and endurance-type uh, aerobic exercise. So if intensity is high enough, both activities can produce improvements in cardiovascular fitness and improvements in strength and hypertrophy and so on and so forth. So modality and the external resistance type, type engaged in doesn't seem to actually matter that much for the physiological outcomes that we're interested in looking at. Obviously, very quickly, it's important to consider, though, that certain modalities may have inherent injury risks associated with them. So when it comes to actually uh, deciding what physical activity to actually engage in, you need to consider those as well. So to quickly ra wrap up, evolutionary type fitness has become very, very popular in both the lay and academic press. Uh, and I think from looking at the evidence, reliance on uh, suggested uh, physical, acti uh, sorry, physical activity adaptations is a bit premature because the evidence is very light in terms of drawing recommendations from uh, extinct and extant hunter-gatherer populations. Also, hunter-gatherer populations don't seem to be as active as we generally think they are. We've been romanticizing that a bit. And uh, what we tend to focus on is the fact that even though they, are, they may be a little bit more active, the volume is what's been focused on when really it should potentially be the intensity of that activity, irrespective of the modality that seems to be the most significant contributor to improving uh, physiological fitness adaptations. So to sum up and recommend then, then, what sort of things can you do and what sort of recommendations can you take away from this? So one, select an exercise mode that's based on personal prefer, uh, preference, or if you're an athlete, your sporting requirement is important. But it's important to consider the risk-reward ratio as well, and whether there are inherent injury risks associated with that, and whether or not you're willing to take those risks when it comes to improving those physiological fitness outcomes. Two, focus on utilizing a high intensity of effort, preferably maximal or near maximal, as opposed to focusing on increasing volume or frequency. That seems to be the most important factor for actually determining those outcomes. <laughs> 
and free. When it comes to undulating, uh, uh, figuring out what sort of frequency, see how you feel. If you feel re well recovered, then train again. Exercise to a high intensity and then rest. Hunter-gatherers, primate populations, spend a lot of time chilling out because they every now and then engage in high intensity physical activity. So it's important to uh, make sure you auto-regulate what types of activities you're engaging in. Thank you very much for listening. And I think we've run out of time for questions. So we'll see. We actually do have about five minutes for questions. If you guys want to ask, that's, that's fine. And just, just uh, so you know, curling is probably not considered appropriate exercise, right? Curling like I know, that. I know he was going to ask that question, or golf. <laughs> so, but Pretty much. Just saying. You know. um, Hi. Hi, thank you. That was great. Um, and, uh, before I ask the question, is it possible to get those slides somehow? There was a lot of information. Uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. I'll, um, I have a ResearchGate profile um, where I tend to upload any uh, publications or presentations on there. So I'll put that on there. Also, um, I've, I've got a full reference list for all the citations as well. Perfect. So I'll upload that so you can follow through, reference check, and do what you like. Great. Now my actual question. Okay. Um, there was a comment in there about uh, training on uneven surfaces. Um, I am assuming that was sort of referring to um, running on a street versus maybe on a path. Right. Um, what, is, what is the supposed gain from that? Uh, is it more physical and proprioception related, or is it just simply to keep you more keen on what you're doing? Um, obviously, that was on the uh, recommendations from uh, the recent papers by O'Keefe, and, and obviously I was trying to focus on the uh, physical, physiological outcomes in terms of like cardiovascular fitness, strength, and hypertrophy. Um, I, I'm not aware of any evidence that that type of activity, you know, the whole barefoot running thing and running on uneven surfaces promotes them. But, you know, there's some suggestion that, yeah, there may be changes in proprioception and benefits from doing that. Um, but, you know, that, that's a whole, whole other talk as well as to the pros and cons of barefoot running and, and how you should kind of go into that. Um, so in terms of, of what the talk was kind of focusing on, um, and like I said, there's, there's not really actually any evidence unless you're a runner that you need to run. So, uh, you know, you can get the same sort of improvements in cardiovascular fitness, strength, and hypertrophy from engaging in other activities if the intensity of effort is high enough. Um, what you get from engaging, you know, performing running is you improve your ability to run. And if you're a runner, then you need to do that. But um, whether or not, you know, anyone else needs to do it is, is questionable. And obviously, you know, running is, in, is associated with, uh, you know, quite a high injury risk. Um, it, it, you know, in terms of the studied uh, uh, exercises and physical activity patterns, running seems to be quite high up on the uh, injury list as well. So I don't personally, unless you're a runner, I don't personally recommend that people should run uh, unless you enjoy it. Like one of the points I wanted to make was that because modality doesn't necessarily uh, matter as much, pref personal preference should come down to it because uh, it's making sure that people actually um, adhere to physical activity programs seems to be the far more important point uh, at the moment. And certainly I'm starting to find in uh, the research that we're doing in our lab that um, it's really easy actually to make an exercise program that's effective it's harder to make an exercise program that people stick to, certainly for the general population. Obviously, most people here are probably quite motivated to actually exercise, but um, so I, I think uh, personal preference has a big impact on that sort of thing. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, you mentioned uh, intensity as being really important. Uh, is it the intensity important because of um, overall general health that yields from that, or are you talking about increased performance and hypertrophy, you know? What we're uh, finding is that um, the physical fitness kind of outcomes like VO2 max and strength and those sorts of things are becoming, we're finding more and more that actually they're stronger predictors of, uh, of uh, mortality outcomes and uh, disease type markers than uh, a lot of the other kind of um, stuff that we tend to look at. So um, the intensity seems to be very important for optimally promoting improvements in those fitness markers, and those fitness markers seem to be very closely tied to uh, like all-cause mortality and those sorts of things. So in terms of uh, optimizing that thing, that, seemed, that, that aspect, that fitness marker that's predicting those things, I think it is important to, uh, to focus on those. Obviously, you know, there's, there's a whole kind of, uh, there are risks and rewards associated with increasing the intensity of exercise, primarily dependent on the modality. Um, so you kind of have to keep those things in mind as well. Pick a safe exercise that you can do to a high intensity of effort, and you're good to go. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Are we have time? Cool. Um, I, I can answer questions at any time during the day, just come find me. I'm, I'm approachable. <laughs> it's approachable, funny accent.
All right, we'll, we'll start with uh, uh,